Okay. All right, we live. Well, greetings, ones and ones. We're here with Five Points International. I'm your host, Corey Harris, dealing with roots and culture from around the world. This week, want to uh, first thank you for joining us here. And also, give you all um, encouragement to like, share, and subscribe because the only way that we get the word out about our show and all the wonderful thinkers and movers and shakers that we have on the show is we get you all to share it amongst your network. So please like, share, and subscribe. Without further ado, we want to welcome the Honorable Pura Fay with us today. Thank you very much. How are you doing today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We holding on over here, but we're so glad <laughs> yeah. to join us. Good. Mm -hmm. And so where where are you joining us from? Where are you living? I am living up in Beauval, up in um it's north uh Saskatchewan. Uh -huh. And um so we're in the boreal forest right on the tree line. So it's all it's green and lots of lakes and rivers. Lots mm -hmm. of bears are sleeping right now. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. lots of moose and deer on the roads. We have to be careful and there's wolf sightings sometimes. And so that's where I am. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good natural life. Yeah, it is. Lots mm -hmm. of little villages, lots of little tiny villages everywhere. Uh huh. And yeah. what the people speaking up there? Um, well, here in Bofau, they speak Cree and English and the right next door is Dene. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're really in traditional Diné territory and the Cree moved in some time ago. So oh. it's Cree and Diné. And you go a little further north, it's Diné and Inuit. Uh -huh. so, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. Wow. So, and I know that originally you're not from up there, though. Tell no, the people no. where you come from. Yeah. Well, 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 I come from, like, what makes me is tons of stuff but um mm -hmm. i'm uh, i was born and raised in new york city and my mom's people are from north carolina mm -hmm. and my father's people are from puerto rico but mm -hmm. um so i was born and raised in new york and then eventually moved to north carolina to be with um my mom's people mm -hmm. and um so sampson county is kind of where my folks are from, Johnston County, North Carolina. I sorry, cut off. What county? I missed that. What do you say? Uh, Sampson County and Johnston County, North Carolina. Uh, uh huh. And then, um, and then I found out later, not too long ago, I found out that they were also living up in closer to the Outer Banks. Um, by the uh, what they call the Nusiak villages, <clears throat> but um, which are Tuscarora villages. But I mean, my family's also like we took in lots of people, and our people were enslaved early in the mm -hmm. seven in the early 1700s. Mm -hmm. And then um, then they brought people over from Africa, and they became a part of our communities as well as um, some of the Scots. These are little tiny communities where, anyway, I'm made up of all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How you slice and dice it, I don't know, but it's all there in me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, wow. Interesting. Um, so, and Tuscarora is your people, your mommy's, your mother's people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both my grandparents, they're both Tuscarora and also um, on grandma's side is also Igbo and Yoruba. We've traced mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And grandpa's like Tuscarora and Scottish mm -hmm. from the Highlands. So mm -hmm. that's, that's but when you look at the DNA test, it's like, what in the world? It's like everything's going on. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So it takes you back to like way back, mm -hmm. way back. Mm -hmm. Like 
before we even know mm -hmm. you know it's like mm -hmm. it's crazy it's mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I remember reading something about you could you could help to educate me about the Tuscarora being the shirt wearers, the shirt makers. Yes, that um. Well, I mean they they were they were not scarure. They called themselves scarure, which is mm -hmm. the hemp, the hemp gatherers. Mm -hmm. So um, and they were master weavers. Nobody even knows that they were master weavers. Mm -hmm. And um, they had, they actually found the Inca loom amongst their stuff and during the fire um, when they mm -hmm. burnt down um, one of their forts. Mm -hmm. And um, so they found like looms. Mm -hmm. So they had a back back strap loom like they have mm -hmm. amongst the Maya people. Mm -hmm. So we had that too. So we wove hemp and some other fibers. So mm -hmm. we did all kinds of things with hemp was like the number one everything. Mm -hmm. um, we made even food, um, mats, everything, coverings mm -hmm. to fine shirt cloth and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. So they wore long mantles, mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's why they called them the long, the people of the long shirt. But um, mm -hmm. so it was for their hemp weavings, and they had lots of dyes. And indigo was very much a part of their world. Indigo mm -hmm. and vermilion, and there was a lots of different dyes, plants that they used to make. Mm -hmm. um, their fibers and wove with, but there's no exist, existing uh, pieces anywhere from before they really took down our world. So pretty much what they found was the looms. And, um, you know, and I'm sure it's some museum somewhere, you know, <laughs> has something. Yeah. So, yeah, and they wove shells, little teeny, teeny shells. They wove mm -hmm. them into their, um, uh, into their weavings and their leather work. They did all kinds of really intricate stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, that leads me into uh, other um, ideas. I, you were talking about the people, Africans, who came over from the Middle Passage from the uh, trade of enslaved peoples. And I remember you doing a lecture one time, maybe it was at Centrum, and you were talking about how the ships never went back empty. Right. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I, I know like super details, but um, who brought that to my attention was Dr. Jack Forbes. Mm -hmm. who was a Native Studies um, professor at UC Davis, who came from Virginia, mm -hmm. the Rappahannock Indian, and he's got a fantastic book that he put out years ago. I think it was called um, African Americans and Native Americans in the blah, 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 cast color. It's a long title, mm -hmm. I don't remember. But mm -hmm. he really documents so much amazing stuff but basically um, he was saying that when the ships left, um, even from here, uh, from the States, that they took native people across mm -hmm. over to the West Coast, mm -hmm. the Ivory Coast. They were also bringing them up to uh, the Canary Islands and mm -hmm. there was just this whole you know, for the triangular trade that they call it, um, it was not only um, African or even West African. I mean, it was everything. They were, you know, it was everybody. And, um, and the same for in the States, there were like Indians from even the Northeast coast, all the way down to Mexico. I mean, they were just, mm -hmm. you know, 
mm -hmm. <laughs> was everybody was being including with um even those in the canary islands like the gaunches all those yeah. berber mm -hmm. people because yeah. we have a huge um amount of berber dna mm -hmm. amongst our peoples i'm like how the heck did this happen i'm like now this is something nobody wrote about in history you know mm -hmm. so um yeah i'm, I'm in complete amazement so mm. that's basically it they said they never left any dock empty yeah. No ships left empty. So whatever they were bringing over, they were scooping up people and bringing them back to wherever they were taking them to. It was just moving us around the planet like we was things and cattle. Right. And it was all about profit. So I can imagine that they wouldn't want to go back empty handed. They're going to figure out how I can maximize my voyage going back to the other, to the West Coast now. Yeah. Right. I can totally see that. Yeah. Mm hmm have you been to the canary islands i have not oh. i have not been there and i Good. am looking forward to being there you would love it it's um and they have some ruins there and they you know it's under spanish control but i didn't see any really talking about yeah. any of the history really they really try and not talk about that but it's obvious they got some ancient Gauncha stuff. And I was in the, I think I was in, I was in Madrid actually a couple of years ago and went to their whatever national museum. And they had a, a Gauncha mummified person under yeah. a case. What? And they had a bunch of artifacts at the Madrid, the national museum. Yeah, and that's the only time I'd seen any, any talk about it really. Wow. Yeah interesting yeah history. they don't they don't talk about who they are mm -hmm. yeah they really don't i've heard that before some other people told me the same thing that they don't they don't talk about that that's almost like the way they did to our people in the carolinas like people a long time ago they were not they were not allowed mm -hmm. to even mention that they were Indian. They were not allowed to, t and even my grandmother and her sisters, when they were little girls, mm -hmm. they were, and even though they were very much, you could see that they were both black and Indian, it's very mm -hmm. obvious. But mm -hmm. when they were little, they were told when the, when the white man comes, and they were talking about the sensitive, they said, when the mm -hmm. white man comes and he asks you, he says, don't you dare tell him that you're Indian. You tell him you're colored. He said, if you mm -hmm. tell them you're Indian, they're going to take you back around the house and cut you up or shoot you in the head. That's what they told these seven little girls, you know. Every day they were telling them that. So I believe that that's the same for those people over there in the Canary Islands. Right. They, were, they, they were not allowed to identify as such that that's long gone. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Wow. And even today, even today, um, mm. our people are looked really down upon in the Carolinas, the Tuscaroras. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. have to be a part of the state recognized process and the names that they gave them, which are brand new names that completely disconnect them from their land, their language, their ancestors and everything. You can't say you're Tuscarora and think you're gonna get any kind of assistance or recognition of any sort. So um, for me to say I'm Tuscarora, it's like, I don't get invited to the big, you know main things only now and then because they mm -hmm. will ask the tuscaroras so that they will look culturally like they know what you know what i mean i hate to say that but it's true yeah you know, but and the people those that are within the whole state recognized process they starve to identify you know as who they really are so mm -hmm. they sneak all that stuff in but they have to put slap that other label on it and then the tuscaroras are like what are you doing mm -hmm. why don't you just you know like say who you really are so there's this big fight in them it's awful because the youth they really suffer 
out of the fight, you know. So anyway, that's, that's, you know, the paper genocide comes in many ways. Yeah. Talk about the paper genocide. Some people don't know about what that means. Well, it's just erasing who you are, erasing your ancestry as mm -hmm. specifically so that the government or whoever's in authority, not power, but authority will um, be able to um, just reign over your world and have everything that is really yours. Yeah. You know, so it's just about authority. And um, so they erase you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's basically what it is. It's like, so you're, you won't be able to identify as who your um, ancestors are. You wow. are now, you know, and names keep changing all over the world. And usually it's because of some type of uh, governmental takeover. So they mm -hmm. just slice and dice people over and over and over and roll them in this flower and you are now this, you know, <laughs> but the ingredients never changes, right? We're still the same and uh, we're still part of the land and, you know, they want you to stop speaking your language and yeah, mm -hmm. so that's paper genocide. So you'll, you'll come up on a piece of paper as something that has nothing to do with your past or mm -hmm. your, your original connection, mm -hmm. what gave life to you. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. Interesting, you know, and it's like, when you look at all of these oppressive systems, when I look at it, I see a way to extract economic means from indigenous people. Because in the end, that's so that they can take resources, that they can take land, so they can enrich themselves and lord over what is not theirs. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I remember also, this is also on, a, on the North Carolina tip, you mentioning about your connection with the monk family, the Thelonious monk. So I wondered if you might um, enlighten us about that as well. Okay. So grandpa, <laughs> mm -hmm. my grandfather kept a monk. Um, his mom is, um, is Hattie, mm -hmm. Hattie Monk. And Hattie's mama is um, Nanis Monk. And that's mm -hmm. my mother's name as well. So, and Nanis is a Tuscarora name. Anyway, these monk women, and before that is Marinda mm -hmm. and uh, these monk sisters, um, before they married into these monk men on the Archibald Monk Plantation, they came over as the Coles. And um, there's a road in, uh, in Sampson, Johnston County, right on the border. Mm -hmm. And that's usually how they would take over a territory is they would like slice it in half and make it two mm. counties and it would mm. break the people up. So my whole family, both grandma and grandpa's family, that's their village. At one time, that was their Tuscarora village. But right on that village line um, were all these plantations. So there was the Coles and the monks and there was a few others. So. Polonius Monk um, comes from like his, well, he was born in um, Rocky Mount, but before him, his family came from Samson Johnson County, from the Monk Plantation. Mm -hmm. And so um, it would be his grandfather and um, his brothers, the monks, these four monk brothers, married these four Cole sisters. Mm -hmm. So so he's double like cousin to my grandfather. So they were both mm -hmm. so they were monk on that side of their family. So mm -hmm. that an art monk comes out of that out of those four brothers as well. Mm -hmm. You know the football player? Art uh, monk yeah. art monk too. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So it's like it's it's fun when you zero in 
on all these places and you see all these relatives and how people are related to each other. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're related to Thelonious. And, um, wow, fascinating. Did you ever get to, I know you're from New York, did you ever run into him and his, and his family or anything when you were coming well, up? Well, we would go, we, we, I don't know if we still go, um, maybe some of them do. I mean, we keep in touch with some of the monks. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, the monk family reunions. Mm -hmm. Some of them take place in Newton Grove, North Carolina. Another time, it, it takes place in different places and the same branch as a family were in Connecticut. So we went to one of their family reunions, which was at a church. Mm -hmm. And they also had a group of women called the Monk Sisters that mm -hmm. sang. So there's a lot of music comes out of that family. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the same in my family and just the music mm -hmm. and you know, the singing. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was neat. So we go mm -hmm. to those now and then. So I've we, seen pictures of your of your mama singing back in the day. Tell us a little bit about your mom and being a singer. Well, mom sang. Yeah, she grew up with her sisters, and they all sang together. They sang opera, which is different because my grandma and her sisters they sang gospel, mm -hmm. and um, and a few of them married blues. Uh, musicians from the Lee Lee family and um, so you know when you go back in our family it goes back that way like from my mom is like opera then before them is gospel and then blues and then some other you know whatever they were I don't know what the labels were then but mm -hmm. um but um that's my family but my mom sang opera and um she and my um my aunties grew up in manhattan they grew up in harlem on 113th street and then um and my grandmother um both my grandparents were not religious people they weren't they came from a traditional type of a, i don't know they were unusual i think but my grandmother did not want her girls to get pregnant, as my Auntie Misha said. <laughs> so she started taking them to this church called um, the um, um, Advent Lutheran Church. And it was run by a, a Puerto Rican priest named Pastor Gensel. And he was a well-known pastor who was known for his jazz church services. And so he had... so. Um, Duke was very much a part of him and his sister, mostly Ruth, Ruth Ellington. Mm -hmm. And so my mom, you know, as she grew older in this church, she became very good friends with Ruth. Mm -hmm. And Ruth just loved my mom. Mm -hmm. And so they became very close friends. So we visited a lot with Ruth and my mother ended up singing with Duke. Um, but there were other people that were part of that church. Like, um, he was very close to Miles Davis and Ola Tunji. I mean, there were all these. And every year, Pastor Gensel put on uh, what they called an all-soul night. So it was 34 hours straight of, of music. It was mostly jazz and all other kinds of music. And different musicians would come in. It was nonstop. And I used to sleep there during that time and wake up and watch and go to sleep again with <laughs> so i was a kid anyway mom sang with duke and she did his sacred concert series mm -hmm. and um she never got recorded like alice what's her name alice babs mm -hmm. and um some of the others that were a part of that but i did go with her um on some of her little tours mm -hmm. with duke um, sacred concert series mm -hmm. and I knew him and we ended up living there also in, in his building on 106th Street between mm -hmm. 105th and 106th and Riverside Drive we mm -hmm. lived there we oh. lived there for a while yeah I lived in Duke and I remember Duke very well as a kid mm -hmm. and um, he was kind he was a kind man Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, he's the one, he influenced me a lot in terms of um, peopling, 
the, the way the world was peopled. Mm -hmm. um, um, I wouldn't say it that way when I was younger, but when I look back, that's really, I remember that album cover of all these different types of people. Um, it was like an artist did um, lots of faces and they were yeah. all brown, black and Asian and like yeah. that. Well, that, I remember finding that in his collection and I pulled it out and I just stared at that. And it's just mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it went into my brain. So, mm -hmm. and then I asked him lots of questions and he was so kind and he answered every question. But I, yeah, I asked him about, it was like, it was like, I started to ask him like, like, what are we? Who are we? You know, mm -hmm. like, what is this? You know, yeah. <laughs> explain this to me. So mm -hmm. he really um, had an uh, impact on my, my heart. Wow. And ancestry. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm actually I went on my phone to see if I could find the name of that album because I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that album. I don't anyway, Google ain't showing it to me. I mean he's got a jillion albums, of course. So Yeah. Wow. Well, what you know, as a little kid, you see stuff every day in the world, and then all of a sudden you see that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, what's yeah. this? You know? Yeah. I yeah. feel this, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. So, wow. Well, so you had a a strong foundation with the music. I mean, and and you know, you turned up to be an amazing musician. So, tell us about your journey from being little and hanging out with Duke and touring with Mama to oh, being well, in your um. Well, I I mean, my mom put me in show business as a little kid and she put me in training and um and i paid for my education too <laughs> through doing commercials and stuff like that so i went to school at lsa which was called lincoln square academy which is like a, a miniature um professional what was that school called you know everybody went there um pcs professional mm. children's school mm. and so I grew up in a school with a bunch of um, kids that were in the business mm -hmm. and uh, um, so people that went to my school were like um, Lawrence Fishburne, um, mm -hmm. um, Giancarlo Esposito who I absolutely loved. And yeah me too. I, He's a, yeah. And Irene Carroll, who was my best friend. And then there was Beverly um, Stills. And um, there was a lot of, there was Robbie Benson, who was really Robert Siegel at school. And mm -hmm. um, Scott Jacoby, there was Pia mm -hmm. Zadora, there was Ben Stiller, who was younger than me. I remember mm -hmm. him very well. He was a menace running through the school hallways, knocking people down. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and there was, um, there was a lot of, so all those kids, um, mm. we all grew up together and made music together. Mm. And um, yeah, like the, a school assembly was always special. And a lot of the parents were amazing. So they would bring a lot to the table. But that school didn't last forever, and I left it, and I wished I hadn't, because I lost contact with all those people. Yeah. And um, But eventually, you know, and I hung out on the streets of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I had some of my street life as well. Mm -hmm. And um, growing up, like, in a Latin um, environment and salsa. And anyway, mm -hmm. it's just when you grow up in New York, you're just exposed to everybody. Yeah. You know, and um so you 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 learn a lot from every household that you visit and friends mm -hmm. you make and and that really is a lot to do with music and um for me anyway because I always life was was so much about the art, the culture and the music and the languages mm -hmm. that people come from, I just drink it up all day. Mm -hmm. I, I lived in a little closet with National Geographic. 
and I, I would just take off and go everywhere <laughs> by mm-hmm. myself and just dream. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was, yeah, it was a kind of a strange child. But when I grew older, I started, um, I mean, I, I trained in American Ballet Theater. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's all my cousins. And all of them are amazing. They're all very talented people. Um, usually they have a double side to them. Like one will be science and then he's a dancer. And then mm-hmm. this one is a journalist and they're a singer. And so they all do like dual things. And um, so on, usually when we bonded, my family would bond in song. When we came together, that was the way we, um, we know each other. Mm-hmm. And so we would really sing and I mean, sing. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> and one year um, we were singing Christmas carols on the porch and was, this was in Queens and some man shouted out the window, shut up. <laughs> 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 and we just kind of laughed, but, um, and we would sing for all the neighbors. We would visit in their house and we'd all pile up just all of us. I was always proud. And I would look at my grandmother, my little teeny grandmother, and she'd just stand there with her chest out and her hands behind her back and just stand there and listen to all of us sing. Like, this is me. (laughs) These are mine. (laughs) So my grandma Easter. So she was pretty amazing. Anyway, so, um, Yeah, I grew up and then ended up in rock bands, punk bands, jazz bands, everything. And when I got pregnant, I had my baby. My mom says, you need to go work. And I said, oh. (laughs) So she called Mercer Ellington. And she says, my daughter needs to come down and audition for Mm y'all. So I did. And I went down. And I can't remember his name. His last name is very well known piano player Roy was it Ayers I yeah should, Roy at least could be ashamed of myself not knowing but anyway mm-hmm. he was there so I went to um, Mercer's place I was so nervous and um and so they put a piece of music down I can't read music and I think it was um something to live for I want something to do da, 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 da. anyway so they put that down and so I started to sing and, and then the phone rang and Mercer says hold on let me just take this so we walked away and I looked at Roy and I said I am so nervous he goes well honey you just keep on being nervous <laughs> and so then um I did it I got the part And so I started singing with the orchestra and there we were right at the New Yorker theater on the top of the New York theater with a rehearsal hall. And that's where I remember my mom rehearsing when I was a little kid and I was just like, wow. And um, so I met um, George Caldwell, the piano player. Um, Uh Yes. And um, we worked together and I loved George. And um, through, through that, I met James McBride through George, who wrote the, the book, The Color of Water. You know that book? So, um, anyway, that was my beginning of, like, band, a band, jazz, like, crossover music, and, um, yeah, that was amazing. So that was some of my beginnings. Eventually, I just started wanting to write my own music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, and I did with that group, and they, they put it all on, you know, they, it was great. But, you know, everybody split and had to do their own things. I don't know, do you know Gerard Harris from Memphis? I do not know. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, he's amazing. Anyway, so these were people I worked with, and eventually I got called to open for um, the American Indian Dance Theater. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you know, they didn't mix all this, you know, bands and this and, you know what I mean? So we were like kind of the first. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, 
to my girlfriend, Sunny, who was singing backup for me then. I said, Sonny, how about coming with me and we take these songs down to a drum mm -hmm. and so get some guys to come in and, and drum for us and we just sing these songs a cappella. maybe do it like 49 style where it's half English, half vocables. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was the beginning of our, that journey of You La Lee. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm -hmm. so that's how it began. And then I eventually just didn't go back with the band. I just kept going that direction because it was just taking us. And um, and at first I remember my family and other people, they were laughing like, what do they think they're gonna do with this kind of music, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, um, then the group grew and there were guys and we got another woman named Matoka. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing harmony and it was just doing its own thing. And then, um, <clears throat> then we ended up just the two of us again, Sonny and me. And I said, Sonny, take that drum home and ask your husband to cut it in half. I said, mm -hmm. I mean, even if it's sacrilege, but we did that and we began to drum ourselves with hand drums. Mm -hmm. To Sadie. <laughs> Hi, Sadie. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, that's it. I mean, that's basically it. And then it became you, Lali. My cousin joined us. Mm. And we traveled all over the world. We were on soundtracks, doing collaborations with all kinds of artists everywhere, mm -hmm. opening for everybody. And um, then I one day decided I'm going to move home. And then mm. I picked up that lap guitar. What year was this? Oh, 2004. Four was the time I, 2000, um, mm -hmm. I, I moved home in 1996, 97. Mm -hmm. And then, then I started to pick up the guitar like in 2001 or two. And mm -hmm. then kind of, not really. But mm -hmm. then uh, in 2004, I moved from Robinson County, went to Chapel Hill and just closed my door. And mm -hmm. I taught myself how to play all these songs that I wrote on the guitar. And mm -hmm. three months later, I went to Music Maker and said, I want to make an album. And he said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I met Taj and then I met, I was starting to meet everybody. I met you, yeah. I met all these people. And so my life went that way. And, um, now wow. so, enough of my when I first met you, that was just at the start of it, of that journey. Yep. Oh, wow. So tell the people about you, Lali. I know y'all um, have a huge, tremendous respect and reputation in the community. So if you could just tell us more about that, where people can find the music. Okay. Um, well, um, when we began, we started out of New York City at the American Indian Community House. Mm -hmm. So, um, which it started with Sunny and me, and, um, and then Matoka and men, and then, but it didn't become called Eulali until Robbie Robertson from the band when he came and he uh, found us and wanted us to do his his first quote unquote native album. Because he's Cher uh, Cherokee, isn't he? No, Mohawk. Mohawk. From Six Nations, his mama, yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, and you know, Sunny back in the day kept telling me, she goes, don't you think he's Indian? I'm like, no. <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> I was like, no, he's not. And, but, so she was totally right. And she must have called that thing in. But mm -hmm. um, he came and came after us. And so that album was called uh, Robbie Robertson and the Red Road Ensemble. And mm -hmm. so we recorded the song Mach Chi. 
-hmm. with him. But before that, I mean, when we started, we were even, we were going to places like blockades, like the whole um, Oka thing and the blockades um, up in Mohawk country, mm -hmm. Lanawage and all the tanks and all that craziness with Mulroney, the prime minister, and that's a whole long story. And mm -hmm. so we would go in a heartbeat, we would jump in a in a car with a bunch of people and show up at places like that and, and mm -hmm. sing for the people. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in Arizona, we did the same thing with the troopers and the snipers were up on the, on the, in the plaza in Pima County. Um, they were all up with their rifles and uh, we brought with us Cece Goldwater, who was Barry Goldwater's granddaughter. We brought her with us, and so the, they had to hold off the, anyway. <laughs> so we would show up at places like that. So we, our group became part of frontline um, stuff, as well as being um, um, courted or collaborations with celebrities and there were so many worlds that bridged for us um, and um, and it was good and the other part was we were women holding hand drums and so which traditionally is okay but because of all of the um, the um, colonizing and the uh, with the um, patriarchy type of mindset uh, with along with the Christianity that they were pushing on the people, you know, skirt shaming and all these things. It's like they took, away, the first thing they did anyway when they got here was take um, the authority away from the family structure and government system, which most of them were matriarchal mm -hmm. and, and, which didn't mean that the women ruled over the men. It just meant that things went through the women's system because they gave birth, the land, you know, food system, mm -hmm. you know, the, the obvious, you know. So everyone had their roles, but they just chopped that off and made it into ownership. Mm -hmm. So all these um, learned um, ways of mm -hmm. the colonizing really stung and and still has a hold on so many of our people and so we were getting you know we were hearing all this like you shouldn't be blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> but there were some elder people that told us don't listen just do what you're doing it's it's medicine and it's healing the people mm -hmm. so we went with that and we just we were we were we liberated something and um, and women all of a sudden all over, not just in North America, but native women all the way down in South America. You know, even when I went to Argentina or Brazil and I met native women that were like, we love your music. We've been listening to you for years. We sing together as a group because of your, you know, and I met even, all over we met women that in fact they even called us to come and help um to, so we were working doing workshops with lots of native women from different places and working with singing and drumming and so forth so that's basically who we are you know mm -hmm. so we've done soundtracks and i mean just all kinds of little bit of everything we sprinkled all over mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. When's the last time you all uh, performed anything together? Um, well, at the original group, the three mm -hmm. of us, Sunny and Jen and me, was years ago, mm -hmm. early 2000s, maybe. Mm -hmm. No, I left them in 2003 or so. Mm -hmm. And then later we, um, when I moved to North Carolina, it was just very hard to mm -hmm. group. So, um, and then I, I, um, 
you know, Jennifer was living in Virginia for a while. But so I took two of the younger women that were my students when I lived in North Carolina. I had, I taught at, um, at the North Carolina Indian Cultural Center through a group called Seventh Generation Group. And so they traveled with, with me and Yulali um, and opened. So it was like a whole dance troupe and and but uh, so when those girls grew up there is um one in particular is charlie lowry mm. and so charlie and layla so um and my cousin jennifer the four of us came together and we did a few concerts and so you'll see online that song called idle no more that mm. was the big piece that we did together and um, and then Jen didn't want to go to Europe, so I just took the two girls with me, the younger women, and we started um, performing around and going overseas. So we were trying to break open as the new Yu La Li uh, mm -hmm. overseas, but it just got really dangerous to me. I could feel something was coming, and I wasn't sure what. And so I asked mm -hmm. the girls, I told the girls, let's take a break for a while. Mm -hmm. and so a year before this whole COVID thing is when we stopped. So that was the last time. <laughs> wow, you knew. Yeah, I felt something was not. I said, I do not want to get stuck on a different rock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, I want to be stuck on this rock. You know? <laughs> hmm. For real. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, um, how many work, uh, records have you done with Music Maker with your own compositions? Um, well, really, one, the very first one. Mm -hmm. Then after that, France picked it up and mm -hmm. started distributing it. And they were really oh. putting... Dixie Frog first. They they were the first ones. So that was in 2006. They released my Follow Your Heart's Desire, and they named it Tuscarora Nation Blues. Mm -hmm. And um, from then on, it was really them and Nueva Onda that that funded and really were pushing my music. So I'd say Music Maker was the first one, uh, the first album. So there might be five or six albums under them mm -hmm. yeah wow and where can people find those on, on my website or you can just go online if you know the names of the albums but my whole um all my albums are up on my putafay.com putafay.com yeah okay. yeah you can download one song or a whole album whatever okay um, Wow. And so how's it been? Um, you know, people ask me this all the time, being a musician during COVID, the whole switch to online, no gigs. What's it been like for you? I mean, I know you're not um, in New York City anymore. You're kind of in, in, the, in the woods. You know, yeah. but what's it been like for you? Um, it's okay. I mean, my husband and I, Max, um, we're raising we're helping to raise three and sometimes five kids, mm -hmm. his two grandchildren and his three grandnieces. Mm -hmm. So we're all in a house together with their dad and uh, Max's brother. Before that, his mom was here, but now she's being cared for. Mm -hmm. um, so it's okay. I mean, I've been doing some uh, workshops online, which is really mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still waiting for Zoom to be able to um, do a <laughs> where we can all sync up together and sing and play music. <laughs> Once that happens, mm -hmm. oh, now we're talking. But mm -hmm. um, it's okay. It's um, you just have to adapt and change and create something new. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard. You know, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking. And I was looking at you and I was thinking, oh my God, I see a whole screen behind you, like mm -hmm. with things going on that, mm -hmm. that have, you, have you ever seen those screens? They're usually still, 
Mm-hmm. Some people, but if there was things going on, anyway, I saw that when I was looking at you early. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I saw this going on. whole thing going on behind you on the screen. Maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Then, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's your latest, I mean, I know you do a lot of, of arts and crafts too. I know you're not just a, a musician. So what other works do you do that you can tell us about? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm sitting here at my craft table. Mm-hmm. So my latest, mm-hmm. it's not finished. I still have shells and I just did the edge beading here. And this What's is, hide? this is moose hide. And then on top is like another, like of a suede that I um, appliqued and sewed it down. And then I paint in it. And it, yeah. it's like a white suede. And then I paint on top different layer colors. And then, uh, I saw that. I love that on Facebook. Thank you. Yeah. So, what is your Facebook address to people also? What? What's your Facebook page? How can people find you on Facebook? Just Pura oh, Faye, right? Just Pura Faye, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's so many on there. I don't know if I can even add any more, but there's a music page, which I neglect a lot. But there mm-hmm. is a band page. Mm-hmm. And, and um, yeah. Wow. Which I should fill some stuff up. I'm not really good on Facebook. I have uh-huh. it. Instagram page too. I just I kind of go on for a while and then I abandon it for a while and there's just hmm. no time. Yeah. Hmm. Well, but um. Sometimes you know live concerts. You know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, I see mm-hmm. you up there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we out here. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess um. The, the final topic I wanted to talk about is um, um, your concept of the role of music and art in this new political reality that we're dealing with. You know, um, it seems obvious through the actions of the, of the present, but soon to be previous administration, that they are on like this, um, like rush, to uh, extinguish resources, people. Um, a lot of times it's under the rubric or the uh, term law and order. So I wondered um, if you could just, you know, just whatever you want to talk about generally about what's going on as far as indigenous rights. I mean, we had Standing Rock a few years ago. We saw how they, the police reacted with the protest there versus what went down in DC last night and the huge chasm between the way they dealt with that. So what can we do as creative people? What is our role in these times? To tell the truth and not to be frightened, to stand up for your rights, always, you can't die. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, our we're born with a purpose and we're given resources. We're a part, we are a resource. Mm -hmm. So we have to align with things that sustain us and give us life. Mm -hmm. And we have to protect that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and and know where there, there is no compromise to killing anything that's alive. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, I mean, you ever watch, uh, there's, do you know Kanahus? Um, she's from the, the Tiny House Warriors. Mm. And they are fighting um, every day. They, they built their tiny houses right on the border of their, their um, homelands, which is unceded mm. territories. It's mm. like mostly in like BC, Canada. Mm. And, um, and um, they are harassed every day by the RCMP mm-hmm. and the people that- the Royal Canadian us. Mounted Police. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they want to build, you know, there and extract more resources on their lands. These are their lands. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. and they have every right to protect it. Mm -hmm. And they have been standing strong and they build little houses and, and it's mostly women that mm -hmm. are doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the other fight is that wherever there are these corporate corporations that are extracting they build these what we call man camps mm -hmm. and this is where you see a huge um amount of missing murdered women and children and men mm -hmm. and so it's all linked to trafficking people mm -hmm. women children and um drugs mm -hmm. and it's all linked to industries Mm -hmm. and, um, so this is your front line now mm -hmm. you know this is this is this is what's going down mm -hmm. you know and here i notice um there's some communities little villages really get blitzed and they blitzed them long time ago with all the residential schools and mm -hmm. the whole faith and they seem to have a better control um over people and people are afraid to speak or afraid to even see or to or even have a, a concept of, it's mm -hmm. like they've really done an amnesia thing on everyone mm -hmm. and, um so very few will get up and stand up for the resources like the trees and but you know we're in a country here this area it's like like fur trapping trappers and hunters fishers and we gather everyone here gathers their food and their medicines their berries you know so these these people still live um mm -hmm. off the land mm -hmm. and um and it's it's not until they start seeing how they're like encroaching in the logging companies which have no right or any they have no reason they, they have no right to be here but here they are, they just build up a company and they just start cutting everything down because the gov government is giving these private entities, these families, uh, permits to come in and start chopping everything down and they overdo it mm -hmm. and they cut up to the water and then the waters rise and everything just gets killed. Mm -hmm. um, so they're really, you know, now you see uh, more and more trappers and people you know rising up and complaining mm -hmm. and uh max my husband like years ago about five six seven years ago now mm -hmm. they fought uh chemical which was a uranium mining company they fought them for four years and won. Mm -hmm. they wanted to put um all the nuclear waste into this earth here into northern saskatchewan wow pristine earth you know mm -hmm. and yeah. life and uh, they won hmm. you can never put your your guard down for too long mm -hmm. and um so i mean we're people on earth like indigenous people everywhere in the world are the ones that live on front lines like they their home has become front lines uh, to fight government corporations and um, so to me artists are so key into preserving and bringing the truth to light for all people to see so it really is our job to um keep everyone aware of what's mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. what's going on um it's it blows my mind to, to sit on facebook and see people uh posting slavery in libya i'm like where do i live mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so it's like so it's like it's everywhere that there's mm -hmm. something major going on, but it's just disguised and covered over and glazed. And you, it's like, it's hard for people to even conceive or believe mm -hmm. what is really going on. So it's music and art really helps people to open up and see 
the truth of what's really going on. When you just blurt it out like that, it's just people go like this. But with mm -hmm. art, it just it brings you in. And and I think it's such a, a power. Now that's power, not yeah. authority. That's power. Yes. You know, that's prayer. That's yeah. That's life. That's breath. That's God. That's, mm. you know, that is, that's what's real. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Hmm. I'm with you. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that is what's real. You know, it made me think about um, <clears throat> recently how Trump um, got these nations together to say that they were going to establish diplomatic relations with Israel. And one of them was Morocco. And the way he did it was he sold out the Western Sahrawi people, the Western Sahara people, because Morocco is, you know, they have basically occupied that area since Spain pulled out in the mid 70s. And they're just disappearing people, killing them off, extracting resources. They got a really long wall that's like longer than the one that's separating the US and Mexico, basically just blocking those people out of their lands. And anyone that says anything gets disappeared or killed off. And previously, you know, the US had not been recognizing, no country really had been recognizing Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara, but Trump, because he wanted to act like you know, he's got this big diplomatic uh, maneuvering genius and he wanted to basically just make it so that it looked like Israel was, um, really it looked like to me it basically is to abandon the Palestinians and make other people totally forget about what Israel's doing to the Palestinians. So he just says, you know what, Morocco, we just gonna recognize y'all, go ahead and oppress and con keep continue killing. Just make friends with Israel and we all good. And so Morocco is like, okay, bet. And that's what's going on. So it made me think of that. But um, Democracy Now! has a, you might want to check it out. They got a nice uh, documentary, about an hour long, talking about Western Sahara and the whole thing that's going on with that. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, I would like to know. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Wow, I think that's probably about it, unless there's anything else you want to talk about. No, I, no? no that's a good, that's a good place mm -hmm. like, for thought and homework and yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got homework too. Yeah. So um, again, it's purafe.com. And you're also on Facebook, Purafe. Any other online platforms you want to tell the people about or anything else? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, I don't know. Um, I can't think of anything else other than just mm -hmm. keep your eyes open and your heart open and, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, don't be afraid to speak, speak yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, that's what time it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it. You know, much love to you and the family. Thank you. all you. take care. I love watching you on Facebook. It's like I'm there sometime, you know? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Max, he loves you. Max wants to watch you all the time when you're singing. Uh, all your little concert stuff that you do. Yeah, yeah. Max is okay. hooked onto your music. So. <laughs> Thank you. Tell him I'm honored. You know, give him, give him a pound. Send him my love. Yes, yeah. I will. Okay. All right. Well, um, you can hit the stop record now, and then um, I'll tell you something else after you hit okay. stop record. Okay. Mm -hmm.